In the first two episodes, you got to hear a little bit from me. Now we're going to switch gears and go into the first interview of the Eric Mueller Show. I had a very unique opportunity to connect and interview an individual who I have long admired as a role model for success and integrity. His name is Mr. Bob Kierlin, the founder of the Fastenal Company. A little bit about Bob. He is a native of Winona, Minnesota. After graduating from Cotter High School, he attended the University of Minnesota, where he received a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering degree, as well as a Master's degree in Business Management. He served two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Venezuela at the Industrial Relations Center of the University of Carabobo in Valencia, Venezuela. Upon returning to the United States, he worked for IBM in Rochester, Minnesota as a cost engineer and financial planner. While working at IBM, he developed a business plan for an idea he had since he was about 12 years old, selling threaded fasteners through a vending machine. After convincing four friends to invest in the idea, the Fastenal company began in 1967. The vending concept didn't work out at the time, although it was resurrected by Will Oberton, Bob's successor as CEO. But Fastenal started selling the fasteners over the counter in wholly owned stores. Bob served eight years in the Minnesota State Senate from 1999 to 2006, representing his district in southeast Minnesota. He retired from the Fastenal board when he turned 75 in 2014. He now serves as a cheerleader at Fastenal, visiting stores, writing columns for company publications, and speaking to new managers. He is currently engaged in several development projects in Winona that keep him busy. With his two daughters and their spouses, he is also on the board of the private Hiawatha Education Foundation that provides aid to Minnesota preschool nonprofit Montessori programs that enroll children from low income families. I am excited to share with you the wisdom and influence of a sensational businessman and truly admirable human being. Without further ado, let's go to the interview. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Eric Mueller Show. My name is Eric Mueller, your host. And today we have a very special guest, our first interview guest on the show. He is from my same hometown of Winona, Minnesota, and he is the founder of the Fastenal Company. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bob Kierlin. Thanks, Eric. Glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I When looking at people to interview for the first one, I, I couldn't have thought of a better person. So I appreciate you being here. I'm really excited to get started. So first question I have for you, Bob, here, how do you define the term success? For me, success for anybody is probably the uh, ability to bring out the potential in other people. You know, people like teachers, we're all familiar with teachers, they bring out the potential by teaching their students things. In the case of business, you really have a successful business only if you can bring out the potential of the people that are joining that business with you. So that, that's how I really define business or success, no matter whether it's a business or profession, it's how you bring out the potential in other people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've, you've written a book called The Power of Fasten All People. And I believe you originally published that in, in 1997 and, and and a new edition came out in 2015, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. It, uh, I think the original printing was 13,000 copies and how many years it took us to sell those. So it's, it's not a big seller, but it's very popular with Fastenal employees. Uh, everybody reads that and it's uh, a way to continue the culture of the company that uh, really was instrumental in making the company successful. Yeah, most definitely. And- you know, you touched on bringing out the the success in other people and, and allowing them to realize their full potential. And that's really strong leadership traits there. 
you know, in the book, you go into the difference between manager and leader, um, you kind of compare those terms throughout the, the course of the book. And that kind of really hit home with me as far as what makes a good leader versus what just makes a, a manager. Yes, you, you, the leader is one that's really relying on other people performing well. You know, I, as you may remember in the book, I mentioned there are only two things that the leaders of a successful organization have to do. One is make sure that everybody that joins is pursuing a common goal. And second, the leaders have to find ways to bring out and use that potential of the people that are joining the organization. And I love what you said in, in the book that you said the best leaders will constantly develop people to take their place. If you want to receive new challenges, you need to develop your replacements. You're available to take those challenges. I, that, that one stuck with me a lot. I really love that part. Yeah, it, it's, it's something that uh, we practice quite strongly. You know, I, I still recall when we were out on our uh, road show when we were going public in 1987, the people in the audience, the institutional buyers of stock, would ask us, you know, you folks as the entrepreneurs can take a company to a certain level, but at some point you're going to have to go outside for professional management. We never did that. We always believed that we could develop our own leadership within the company, and we've done that. Uh, you know, other people form the Fastnall School of Business, which has uh, certified educators teaching our people leadership, teaching us product knowledge, teaching us a teaching salesmanship, accounting, anything you want to take as a course within the company, you can develop your potential. And that's where our leadership comes from. Everybody everybody keeps growing. I, I just had occasion to talk to the people that were celebrating their 25th anniversary with Fastenal. There, there were 74 people. And I, I brought out the, the fact that of the 74, five of them, were regional vice presidents. You know, that's the next level to getting into the executive ch uh, chairs. And five of those had started as assistant managers and had all grown within the company. You know, we, we don't go outside to hire those people. I always like to tell our new managers that I only can find two skills that we've had to go outside for uh, to hire. And, and I really blame that on, on our people because those two are our lawyers and our CPAs in accounting. And that's because our people aren't getting their law degrees and their CPA degrees so that they can take over those positions. But otherwise, all of our leadership comes out from within our company. Yeah, and that, with, with the exception of those couple of examples you gave there with just not getting that degree, um, you know, that's something I, I really have always admired with the company. Uh, my, my grandfather and my dad um, work for Fastenal. Um, I worked for Fastenal part time throughout throughout high school, and you really could see that that the you know your your people that were in those leadership roles, regionally, nationally, you know they started at the you know the lower level you might say or the entry level positions, and to grow that from within, I feel like really speaks to the integrity of the company, and and like you said, to to bring out the best in others, if you can get someone in who's starting at an entry level job out of high school, and eventually develop in, into a regional VP. You know, that's bringing success to the company and it's, it's allowing them to feel fulfilled. So that's, that's awesome. Yes. So you touched on entrepreneurship there and, and, you know, when your company went public at, at what point did you know that you wanted to become an entrepreneur? Well, probably, probably when I was about eight or nine years old, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, at the time I grew up, uh, you know, it was right after the second world war, it was kind of a hard scrabble time and, and you, you had to uh, be resourceful as a kid, even, you know, the, the, the confectionery stores didn't even have bubble gum because that, that had all been rationed during the war. And I, I, don't, I remember my, my parents, uh, we had, they had five children. I was the youngest. And they had, when I was born, they had just purchased a home near the downtown area. And my, my mother rented out the rooms upstairs uh, to help pay for the mortgage on the house. And we all lived downstairs in the house. My, my buddy and I, from he lived across the alley uh, in another home. And by the time we were eight and nine, we were taking our bikes early in the morning in the summertime, going around the town and picking up popsicle bags out of the street. 
because in those days, the popsicle company that's, that was the iced tea company we had the local dairies making popsicles and vegetables. And they offered prizes for the kids that sent in bags. Well, we would go around the town collecting those bags and our, on our bikes with a basket with a cardboard lid on it. We would send in as many as 4,000 bags at a time <laughs> and get things like baseballs and catcher's mitts and, and things that we would sell to other kids in, in the neighborhood. You know, and it was that type of adventure for me. Uh, and then when I, my father started an auto cart store when I was six, at the age of seven, I would go down after school. I'd walk down there. That was the other thing that was unique in those times. Kids had more freedom to do that. Nowadays, a seven year old kid walking three and a half blocks through the downtown area alone might be a little suspect. But yeah. what, I could do that then. Yeah, and he would pay me a nickel to sweep the floor. And then by the time I was 10, I had learned all the parts in the catalogs and I was acting as a counterman. Uh, by the time I was 12, he had uh, allowed me, because the store closed on Saturdays at noon, that I could stay down there rather than get calls from the garages that needed parts and have to go down to open up again for them, that I could stay there and he would pay me an 8% commission on the sales for all the sales that I would make. Well, my buddy and I would go down there uh, and play cards together while, while waiting for customers. Uh, it was penny ante poker just between the two of us. Sometimes the customers would join and my dad never heard, heard about that. So yeah, that, that was part of the life as a, a kid growing up in Winona that we did things like that. And it, it really made for an environment that I, I thought while I was in high school of, of several ideas for businesses, and I knew I would eventually like to be running a factory or something of that nature. So uh, all, all through my college years, I was thinking of the businesses that might be possible with the education I was getting. Yeah, so it started at a young age, and, and it kind of leads me to think, do you think there's some sort of pattern or formula to becoming a successful entrepreneur like you you have it deeply ingrained within you, obviously, and it started at a very young age. So if, if someone is sitting in like my position, I'm in my late twenties. Um, do you think it's too late, or is there is there some sort of formula that I can try to harness to to bring out those traits? Well, it's it's uh, not a formula as much as uh, uh, an advice that I would give people that are thinking of starting a business. The the, the first thing is. Uh, to appreciate not how much you know, but how little you know, and go out there, find the smarter people that can help you understand whatever it is you're, you're trying to do. Because I have invested in other companies that didn't make it. And, and in two cases, it was just not understanding the market. And in some cases, it can be things like not understanding the finances and how cash flow works. Uh, I, I, I've been asked several times by people that are starting business, what's the thing that, if you wanted to tell me one thing that really stood out, uh, what would that be? And that, that idea that I, I always would uh, communicate to them is whatever you're doing with your business plan, whatever you think you need for cash to start this business, make sure you've got another 20% of that total in your back pocket that you can use in an emergency because you're not going to have everything thought out properly yet. And, and you got to have that reserve to fall back on to get, it, get over the cash uh, demand uh, peak that you will actually have. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great piece of advice. I think that that makes me start, um, you know, thinking gets the, the gears turning as far as, you know, what's important when you're trying to start a business and, you, know, you really got to think of those those nitty gritty type things to not. You might have the best idea, but if you don't think of those types of details, it might not pan out. It, is there a common myth about starting a business that you want to debunk here? Is there anything you think that people have in their mind about this is always what happens when people start businesses? Or well, the, the first thing that you're taught, of course, in, in business programs, is to get a plan, have a business plan. And I've seen good ones, and I've seen poor ones. You know, and, and uh, invariably the poor ones fall short because they haven't thought of everything. That, that's why I say try to learn as much as you can before you really get started in the business. You know, I'll, t I'll give you an example in, in, in the fast business when we started. 
I had the basic idea of selling faster through a vending machine, which was way ahead of its time because the vending machines at that time were all mechanical. There were no electronic components like you have nowadays. Uh, and and it, it, it ended up not working because we discovered that the demand for the product was such that the number of pieces didn't fit in the vending machine that the customers needed, or the length of the fastener was too long to fit in the box. So instead of having a vending apparatus in the building where people would come in on their own and get it, we still had to have somebody there. So then why have the vending machine if you had to have somebody there anyway? So it, it's that type of thing that you, know, you realize early on that you have to make some adjustments for. The, the, the other thing, when, when I talk about knowing the marketplace, we knew what the market was for selling. What we didn't know is the marketplace for acquiring the product we were going to sell. None of us had any experience in acquisition or buying of fasteners. So we had to scramble to find out where do you get these things? And the only thing I had available for me was a catalog listing that I found of a company in Chicago that had everything in fasteners listed by uh, commodity and what size and how many they had. And so I ended up buying our initial inventory, which was something like uh, about $5,000 worth of inventory from them. Afterwards, we discovered that outfit was a surplus and obsolete buyer of fasteners from other users. And what we had were all the oddballs <laughs> where if, if I, I, I always said this when I was taking care of the counter in Winona, that if somebody came in in those early years and asked for a three eighths by two lag screw, I would go to the shelf and discover our stock was three eighths by one and seven eighths or three eighths by two and an eighth. We didn't have the standard size. And so I tell the customer if I found the one and seven eighths that this was better because it was safer, it wouldn't go through the wood on the other side. And if I had the two and an eighth, I claimed it would have better holding power. So, you know, it, we, we adapted to it and eventually discovered how to really buy the passers. But that was a, a shortcoming for us at the beginning. And it, it cost us a couple thousand dollars in our initial capital. Yeah, that that that's awesome. I I, I know that the, the idea of that vending machine was something I'd read about um, in your in your biography that that you had in. And that idea, it, it didn't actually get off the ground immediately for you, but your successor as CEO implemented that successfully within, within Fastenal. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And of course, things have changed with, with the machines that were available. Uh, now, now it's all electronic and, and you can do it with cards and you don't need to put in coins or anything of, of that nature to get the product that you want. Uh, I, I, I had a conversation one time with the older gentleman from the company that at the time was when I talked to him was building our machines for us currently and we were talking about those early days in the 1960s when I was trying to design this big vending apparatus and at that time he was making cigarette pack vending machines they were the only really practical vending machine at that time other than gumball and things like that and he said that when, when the price of a pack of cigarettes went from 50 cents to 60 cents, they had to modify their coin shoot devices. Instead of having two holes for two quarters, they put in the third hole for the third quarter. And then every pack of cigarettes had a rubber band with a diamond and nickel wrapped in to make the change. The right change back in those days. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, a lot has changed in the you know, the technology, I mean, that aspect is kind of what kind of what expires me a little bit is I have, I have aspirations to create a healthcare company, namely at the intersection of healthcare and technology is what I'm looking at. And, you know, in five to 10 years, I might not, we might not be able to see what, what technology is available at that time. So to, to kind of have that, that forward thinking visionary mindset, um, I, I feel like that is pretty essential to being a successful entrepreneur. Would, would you agree with that? Do you think, you know, being a visionary and as well as motivating people to, to be successful? Yeah, you, you have to, and you have to have people that are working for you that are, are in those areas that, that are instrumental in developing it. That, that's why you have to have what 
is one of our strengths is decentralized decision making. That we've got people in the departments of IT that are making the decisions about how are they going to advance the technology within the company. And same is true for our logistics and shipping. You know, those people are making the decisions. They're not coming from the top down. Uh, you know, when I, I, I consider what, what is occurring with technology, there's no way that I would have ever been able to be instrumental in, in putting any of those ideas forward. They're coming from people that really know the field, tend to be younger people that, that have gone through the, the use of all these devices and then find better ways to use them and, and keep coming up with innovative ideas for us. I, I, I really think that uh, our IT department uh, one of the things that got going was our commitment early on to try to develop our own software as much as possible. You know, when, when I consider that other competition was buying their software from other people, then every time the customers needed something different it's in terms of a report, they'd have to go back to the supplier of the software to get it rewired or re redone. Uh, when we would have potential customers coming to visit uh, our Winona facility, we would take them around to our TD, IT department and our, our trucking and manufacturing departments, and they would see what we could do. And when they asked uh, something about the reports that they needed to our IT people, the IT people would say, well, just tell us what you need. We can do that. You know, it wasn't a matter of going out to somebody else to get it redone and retested. We could do it all ourselves. And, and the customers came to appreciate that. Yeah, decentralized decision making, that was a, a topic I really enjoyed in the book. And, you know, it's not your traditional hierarchical top down model where you have the CEO at the top and it goes down. But, but you described the CEO is in the center of, of a, a series of concentric rings. And that allows people to, you know, be able to have their potential brought out by, by having that freedom to, to do those things. And, you also mentioned chaotic communication as a strategy. Would you mind elaborating on that term? I, I use the term because uh, when we started, of course, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have Google. So what we did is we knew we wanted to have everybody being able to communicate with everybody else. So everybody had their own, uh, everybody else's phone number and they could call anybody within the organization if they had a question about anything that they were doing or a request from a customer that they didn't know how to satisfy, that somebody else might be able to help them. We also uh, did a weekly newsletter that went uh, out on our truck routes, because we had by that time our own truck routes going out to all the branches. And the newsletter had all the information that we could put in there, what people were doing about new ideas, et cetera. So all of that was going on. After the internet came on, then we had everybody with access to everybody else's internet address so they can send an email to anybody in the company they, they wish to. And you know, it's that open communication that I think is so important. Rather than having the, the structure that I was familiar with in the former employer of mine, where if I had a question for somebody in another department, I discussed it with the manager in my department, who then discussed it with the manager in the other department, who then went to the person I really wanted to talk to. And then the whole thing came back. And by the time it came back, it was not exactly the same question that I had asked or wanted to ask. So I, I, I learned that, uh, that you want to talk directly to the person to get less static in, in, in the background and getting the best solution. Yeah, I agree with you there. I, I definitely think that, that that is a way to help, you know, help a business be more successful and just help help people feel like they're more valued. What, what would you define as your greatest challenge that you encountered or, and overcame in, in your life and career? What did you learn from that? In all honesty, uh, and I've said this before, uh, the greatest challenge uh, for me and for most people is raising children. Uh, with my late wife, we raised two great daughters, uh, and I've said that before. That you know, that's the greatest accomplishment that I can cite in my life. Now, if you want to ask about business, in, in business, the probably the, the greatest achievement uh, was to see the development of our people and the growth of the company. You know, when 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 we were going public uh, in 1987, and we were asked 
you know, how big can the company be? At that time, we thought because we were only in fasteners that within the United States, we could, we could have about 500 stores. And that was the number we were using. At the time, we had 52. So 500 seemed large compared to the 52 we had. But uh, to see it go way beyond that with the leadership within the company and uh, to see where we are now uh, in, I don't know, 25 countries of the, of the world and, and still growing and still getting new product lines, new ways of, of, of treating uh, customer requests that we can do various ways of distribution and logistics. Uh, it, 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 it all came home uh, for us this year. You know, I don't know if, how long you're, you're going to have this available, but you know, this is being recorded in November of 2020. And, and at that time, the pandemic is going on and we've got the, the vaccine coming. But you know, to see what Fastenal people did in March and April when, when the reality of what was happening with the pandemic to get the product through the supply chain to the people that needed it to do allocations and, and to satisfy the quality requirements because at that time we had quality people in Asia in, in uh, not just in China, we had in, in Vietnam, Taiwan, and, and all of those things worked together uh, because we were so decentralized and, and, and people could react immediately that we ended up in, in 2020 with our revenues being higher than they were in 2019. And for any business in, in the midst of this pandemic to do that, that, that I think is a significant accomplishment. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. And, you know, you've ingrained that decentralized decision-making and chaotic communication in your company from the start. So when something like 2020 pandemic happens, they're not adjusting to something new. They've, it's already been you know, kind of deeply ingrained within them throughout their entirety of the time with the company. Now, you mentioned Fastenal becoming big and growing exponentially as your greatest business achievement. At what point did you know that Fastenal was going to become as big as it is now? I think over 2,000 stores, I believe. Um, at that time, you said there, there was 52 at the time it went public? There were, you know, there were di di different times when you sit back and say, well, this is very good and it's going to get better. I, I think we knew we were going to make it after we had about five stores because we had a pattern and we knew what we were doing. Uh, I think another significant point was uh, going public in 1987. Uh, I think many of your listeners will, will not uh, appreciate this for well, but it was a pretty small offering. It was a million shares and the original price range was seven to nine dollars. You know, so you can see how small the deal was. We were taken public uh, and and went on the road show for the week beforehand, and, and it was very satisfying for us that that we're doing the road show presentations. One of the salespeople for for the investment banker told us after our presentation at a luncheon in New York City that he had the deal sold three times just in New York. I, at the night before the uh, pricing, I got the call from the investment banking house saying that they could get more for the stock than the $9 top that we had put on it. And I said no, because we had promised our employees of the million shares, 100,000 would be allocated to them on a percentage basis of the duties and how long they've been with us. And we didn't want to go above the $9 because that's what they were familiar with. So we went out at $9. The, right away, it shot above the price. This was in August of 1987. You may remember the stock market crashed in October of that year. We were the only one of about 500 stocks that had gone public that year that did not fall back on the crash date below their offering price. And at the end of the year, the Wall Street Journal published a list of the top 500 performing IPOs that had gone out with a price of $5 a share. We were number one you know, that we had done that. Uh, you know, for our little company back here in Winona, 
the time with 52 stores. We really felt great about that. I, I, I had another, um, when, when, when uh, thinking about this, uh, one of the times that I, I really came to appreciate what FASTO was in terms of how we looked at people and what great things people can do was in 1986, the year before going public. At that time, we had built a new 50,000 square foot facility here in Winona. The progression had been when we started in 67, we had a 1,000 square foot building. In 74, we moved to a 7,000 square foot building. In 81, we moved to a 23,000 square foot building. Here in 86, we had decided we were gonna keep the 23,000 building, and but use that for manufacturing only and move the distribution center to the new 50,000 square foot building. Well, at the time we were servicing our customers through our branch stores, the branch stores would call twice a day back to Winona with the, the want list that they had to satisfy their customer orders. And our people would fill those so that they could go out on the truck for the next delivery day. The last call-ins came from our branch stores that Friday afternoon at one o'clock. Right after that, everybody, including the accounting departments, the, the uh, people that worked as the janitors, and anybody that worked for Fastenal within 25 to 50 miles of Mona came here. We worked all Friday night moving everything. We worked all day Saturday moving everything. And a few people had to work on Sunday to pull those orders for the people that had wanted product on, on Friday. On Sunday night, the truck drivers who had already worked so many hours that they couldn't drive the semis and they had delivered 50 loads, semi loads, from our 23,000 square foot building to the 50,000 square foot building. And instead of the truck drivers in order to drive the truck, because they couldn't, our executives, many of whom had their, their, their CDL license, uh, went and drove the trucks with the uh, regular drivers riding shotgun to give them directions of where they were supposed to go. We didn't miss a single delivery to any of our customers on a weekend that we moved 50 truckloads into a new facility. And that, that Monday morning, I looked in that warehouse and I just thought, you know, what a deal we have here that people are willing to stretch for our customer service requirement that, uh, you know, that's really what drives us is that to get the customer service and maintain the growth. And I, I just felt such uh, pride in, in what our people have been able to do. Absolutely. And, and you know, building a successful customer base, I feel like is a topic that, that I believe to be a pretty tough thing to do. Um, you know, marketing is, is behind that. And um, were there any specific tactics that you found most successful when marketing your business as it began to grow? Uh, well, of course, uh, when we started out, we knew that uh, the best marketplace for us was in communities the size of Bonona, which is 27,000 population. Uh, we looked for uh, cities between 25 and 50,000 population that had about 4,000 people or more employed in either manufacturing or construction. That was kind of the base. And we also knew that those communities typically did not have a specialist faster distributor within the community. You know, they were relying on the metropolitan areas to service them. So there, there really wasn't any direct competition. But what we did with the marketing in those communities, and this was kind of the strategy that uh, befit us, we knew that we wanted to get the reputation for having everything that you might need in the faster, because otherwise the customers are going to hardware stores and farm fleet stores to get basic fasteners, but they didn't have the oddball specialties. Well, at that time, I was buying some U.S. government surplus, uh, and, and I, I one time I, I remember getting a full semi-trailer load for about $500 and just having all kinds of things that were in there, including a lot of fasteners. Uh, but we would take all of the things that had any threads on them and put them on display in the front showrooms of our stores so that when people walked into those new stores in their communities, they would see, it would be a wow, really go on, I have special, you gotta go see this place, <laughs> because 
they've got things in there. We, we also would, would make sure that uh, that our, our 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 largest fasteners were all on display out in front, you know, so that they wanted to have a chance to see an inch and a half by fourteen grade five hex patch group. We had those out on display. And the same was true of anything that was small or large. Everything was out on display. We showed them the oddballs. And that was a marketing strategy that really worked. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. And it sounds like, you know, unique to to want to create a, a, an environment where the customer can find whatever they're looking for. Um, you weren't just going to sell them one particular product, but you were going to try to be there to have available whatever they might be looking for that day. So we've talked a little bit about business. So I'd like to just kind of chat a little bit more about life in general for you. Who has been your greatest in- inspiration throughout your life from a success standpoint, from you know being a father, a grandfather standpoint? Who has that been? I think my, I've, I've thought about that and been asked that several times before. I, I usually uh, like to cite the, the three people that I, I really think influ- had an influence on me, even though I didn't always come into a lot of contact with them. But it was just the impression they left on me. One was when I was in grade school at a, at a Catholic elementary school here. The pastor uh, eventually uh, became the pastor of the new cathedral that was being built. So he obviously had administrative abilities and, and, and financial skills for fundraising. But what really impressed me is when I was in grade school, when it came report card time, he would come into each classroom and the teacher would give him the report cards. He would call each person up by name, give him a report card, and he'd make some kind of encouraging statement to the, to the child that was there. And, and that really left a lasting impression that here's a kind person that, that bolstering uh, every child that's here and, and giving them encouragement. Uh, the second person uh, would have been Joe Bamadick. Joe Bamadick uh, was the founder of Peerless Chain Company here in Winona, uh, came back from the First World War and started the company. By the time my father had started his auto parts store and I would be there as a kid, I I would see this older gentleman walking uh, down the street and I asked my dad who that was. And he said, that's Joe Bamanick. He's the guy that started Peerless Chain and, and family owns the company. And after I finished my engineering school and I had my degree in mechanical industrial engineering, I took a a desire to to, to find some part-time job where I could use my skills while getting a master's degree in business. And I I wrote a letter to Joe Bamanick, a peerless, and he was kind enough to pass that on to his manufacturing superintendent who called me in for an interview and they hired me. This would be in 64 at pricely wage of, of $3 and 50 cents an hour. I could work 20 hours a week for them while going to the university of Minnesota, because I, I they let me work 10 hours on Saturday and 10 hours on this, my swing day, which was either Monday or Friday. That was enough to pay for my education while I was getting my master's degree. Uh, and, and I did so much, engineering work, mostly in industrial engineering, that I developed a lot of skills that I would not have had. So I really admired Joe Bamanek for doing that. Uh, the third person after we had started Fastenal was uh, Al Kurtzman, who was uh, the guy that had started a dredging company here in Winona. And I got to know him because he would always come in and, and buy the fasteners that he needed for his dredging equipment. And he would always encourage us saying, you know, this, you guys are doing a great job. This is a wonderful service that you provide to the community and the people that need products like this in a community this size. He also said that, that as he got older and was semi-retired, he would go over to the local Elks Club sometimes in late afternoon and he'd find other people who had started business and they'd be in there playing cards. And he said, you guys don't do that. You're, you're here always working. And, and he said, you're going to make it for that reason. You really are dedicated to what you're doing. And I, I thanked him for that. And, you know, for that reason, those three people really stand out as, as ones that I admired because they had the same 
perception that I was acquiring from watching them. Yeah, and on that topic of work ethic, um, you know, working all the time and, and really devoting sincere time to your business, how many hours a day did you do you feel like you worked on average when you were acting CEO of a fascinating company? Uh, well, I, I probably averaged, uh, not by the day, probably about uh, 60 hours a week because, of course, I, I worked uh, Saturdays and occasionally I would do some book work on Sundays. Uh, and, and it was a little bit different because I would go in early in the morning when my kids were still asleep. Uh, the, the arrangement we had is... Uh, my late wife was a ballet instructor, so she would have the kids after school in the ballet classes. Uh, so I could be working there, but when they came home, I had the dinner ready for them. So I worked early in the morning. I called the kids on the phone to wake them up and talk to them in the morning. And then they went off to school. Uh, but I saw them in the evening. And then after they went to bed, I usually did some more book work because I was doing all of the accounting at the time for the the company. Uh, so so that, that, that's probably, oh, I, I, I'll tell you this story if, if you want to interest me for why, why my two children are not actively involved in the company. Uh, they, they, they're, they, they're certainly interested in it and they know all about it, but they're not employed by the company. The reason is that I think they were two and a half and maybe four, four and a half. They, uh, they were with me on a Sunday morning and I had to stop and do something at the Winona store, which is at the time was in our 7,000 square foot building. And the building was situated so that the windows and the door faced the street. And we walked into the showroom, which was just in the front and the office was to the side. Then there was a wall was a warehouse in the back and two doors led there. And I told them, now you got to stay here in the front area where I can see you and don't go out in the, Back warehouse. Oh, yeah, they were going to do that. So I'm in the office and it's, I looked up once and they weren't there. They had found their way through one of the doors into the warehouse. Well, on the other side of that wall, we had shelving, but on the floor, we had these cardboard boxes that were about a foot square. They were open on the top. They housed all of our small machine screw nuts. These are really small nuts with different threads. I found them taking a handful from one box and putting them in the next box. And I said to them, you're never coming here again. <laughs> and they appreciated that. Oh man. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a wonderful story. And, and as far as being an entrepreneur, having a family, um, ex kind of explain how, how that impacted your family life. If you know, you, you mentioned working, you know, you found the time to, to make, work happen in the morning and at night so you could still spend time with your with your children but other than that how how did you find entrepreneurship affect your family life well i don't think it uh, really had much of an effect in, in terms of uh, appreciation of, of how the business was growing I, I think that came home to me uh one day when my youngest was in college uh i got a call from her uh this was after you know we were well, when she was in college, it would have been 94 or five. And, and she called me and said, Dad, my friend here got a hold of the, uh, the proxy statement for your annual report. And it shows how many shares of Fastenal stock you have. And he calculated out with the price what how much that's worth. She says, I never realized that. And... You know, that, that's the way we wanted it to be. We, we just wanted to be normal people in our community. Yeah, that that's, you know, that just speaks to the, the humble nature of, um, you know, when you realize you're, you're getting getting big in a company and growing exponentially and, you know, have a have a net worth of X amount of dollars to, to maintain that that humble and, and philanthropic mindset like you have, um, you know, your philanthropy has impacted numerous people, especially those in our hometown of Winona. Is there a most joyful memory you have of giving back to the community? Oh, well, there are, I, I, I could say it's several, but the, the one, one thing that we did, my wife and I did, he, that I think is the most satisfying uh, in terms of how many people it helps, uh, was to 
established something called the Emergency Services Fund here at the Winona Community Foundation. What that does is provides emergency funds for individuals who need funds for things related to uh, immediate shelter, uh, help with a utility bill that they're unable to pay at the time. Uh, it can be things that uh, people need diapers for their kids and don't have the cash. Uh, it's it's uh, oftentimes things like transportation to, to a job or to a funeral. Uh, one that I remember very well is somebody was able to get a job because with the fund they were able to get uh, hard toe shoes to take the job that they uh, required those, those shoes on. Uh, I think it, we, we operate, uh, the, the community foundation handles the whole thing through about 10 or 12 charitable or social agencies here. Uh, and the, the payout max is is $1,000 a year to anybody. And probably the median is, is somewhere under $100 but it still distributes about $130,000 a year in emergency funds like that. And it, to me, that's one of the most satisfacting or satisfactory things that we've, we've done in philanthropy. You know, you can do a lot of things like scholarships, but with scholarships, oftentimes uh, you give them and the institution that we actually receives the money just takes it off the financial aid that they were going to give the student anyway. You know, so it, it doesn't necessarily have the benefit that you can see when you know that it's going to take care of a, a real need in the community. Uh, the other one that is, is the biggest thing that our family foundation has going for it uh, is a program that my, my two daughters and their spouses are, are the other directors. We have a grant program for preschool Montessori programs in the state of Minnesota that take children that are low income and we provide the financial aid so that those low income children can be in those preschool Montessori programs uh, because my two daughters went through preschool Montessori and, and uh, I think we have an appreciation of the difference that that can make in those formative years for young children uh, and, and give them the head start so that when they get into the upper grades you know they, they're ready uh, if, if the if they're good programs, and, and these are, the, the child comes out of kindergarten already reading and knowing the, the numbers. Yeah, thank you for sharing those, those two examples there, Bob. And it makes me think of another topic in your book where you, you talk about suppressing your ego. And uh, when, you, when you give back to, you know, in a philanthropic way, you're not doing that because of the recognition you're going to receive. You're doing it because it's the right thing you, you, you know it's the right thing to do. Um, for someone who is, you know, maybe 10 years down the road, let's say I have created a successful business and, and, I'm, and I'm thriving in that way. What advice would you give me to, to suppress that ego and not let my, my head get too big, so to speak, um, you know, to keep that humble mindset? Oh, uh, well, I, I, I would say number one, uh, don't build yourself a mansion or buy a big yacht. <laughs> that, that, that to me is, is something that, that says, you know, you're using a lot of the funds for your, your own pleasure and uh, you, you may not need it at all. You know, if, if you really want to be philanthropic, you appreciate that you take what you need and, and you don't have any uh, wants that are going to cause you any real problem. And what you're doing is, is using the wealth you've accumulated to help others. You know, I, I, I get a great deal of satisfaction knowing that my estate uh, will benefit a lot of people and my children are already attuned to what they'll be doing in, in terms of helping others when I'm no longer here. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Bob. I, I know that that is, it's something you see with, you know, company founders of, you know, bigger companies and, and you see the kind of the lavish lifestyle that they live and, and it, you know, it seems, it seems, seems pretty glorious. It seems pretty great, but I, I feel like at the same time, you know, that wouldn't, the person that I am wouldn't change by being able to have those types of things, or I certainly would hope that it wouldn't. Um, so keeping that integrity, I, I appreciate you speaking to that point. Thank you. Yeah. So, so the backbone of my show, the backbone of the Eric Mueller show is really to really to dive in and see what makes a successful person's inner clock tick. Is there, is there one single driving force or maybe a couple driving forces that, that, that keep your inner clock ticking towards success? I would say that to always be 
uh, thinking of why something is right or why something is wrong. Uh, I, when I read a newspaper, oftentimes I come to the conclusion that I know the article was written by somebody, but the headline was written by somebody else. And I can ju judge the headline writer didn't really understand the article. You know, it's, it's that type of thinking. And you, the same thing with everything that you see about how people are doing things or, or uh, buying things and packaging things, you know, you keep questioning why. Why is he doing it this way? Is there a better way? If you stay with that type of uh, think, thinking, uh, you're going to be more attentive to how you can make suggestions for change that are beneficial. You know, I think everybody has a particular skill uh, in something that they're going to be able to develop if, as long as they stay open-minded. Once you you close your mind off that what you're doing is right and you're not going to pay any attention to anything else, uh, you, you start to lose it. I, I'll tell you that here's an example that I, I really stands in my mind uh, about uh, what you really believe in. I was being interviewed on the phone from a publisher that was doing an article where they were calling probably 20 other CEOs in the same industry, asking the same five or six questions of everyone so that they could publish the opinions of each uh, interviewer or interviewee that separately. They, and, and when you're doing those interviews, you, you become conscious that they always have one question that's kind of the oddball question. Like if you're a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Uh, you know, that type of thing. Well, this particular interview, the question that was that one was, what is your motto? I quickly realized I didn't have one. And so I thought, if I were to have one, what are the real absolutes that I believe in? And I came up with it, and it is my motto now. Believe in people and in free markets. You know, those two things, I think, really define what has been my position, uh, both with people and with uh, economics and the economy and, and, and the political side of it. I, I just think that those th two things really define what people and this country are all about. Yeah, I, I remember reading that in your book, that the, the oddball question of what is your motto? And it, it really made me think of, uh, you know, when I was interviewed for pharmacy school at the University of Oklahoma, I, I was asked the oddball question of if I was to be the producer the writer or the actor of a film, what would I choose to be? And, and I thought, you know, right. They, they want to test how you're thinking on your feet. And, and that, that for me, I was, you know, kind of taken aback for a second and, you know, I had to think quickly on what I wanted to say, but, but it just kind of makes you think that you, you got to be pre prepared for everything in life, really, in a way. Um, you never know what someone's going to ask you and your ability to kind of mold your answer. And it, what, what was true came out of you at that time. So your, your motto of believing in people and free markets, that was true to you. And although you didn't know that was going to be the answer at the time, I, I, it probably always was the answer. Is that, is that right? And what, what was your answer? My answer was writer. Writer, okay. Yeah, if I said, you know, kind of like you said earlier, I mean, I, I'm like, if I was the writer, I would know that, that that was my idea that came out there. The story was something I wrote, but you know, on the, on the credits, I'm probably not the first name. I'm definitely not on the cover of the movie box. Um, I wasn't the director, but, but I know that it was mine, whether people know it or not. So that, that's great, great perspective. Yes. So Bob, we, we grew up in the same hometown and, and actually went to the same high school of Cotter high school. Do you have a favorite childhood memory of growing up in Winona, Minnesota? Oh, oh gosh. Uh, I, I really don't have one favorite, but I, I think the overall theme was the freedom that we had uh, is to go fishing, you know, on our bikes across the, the into the sloughs of the Mississippi River. You know, it's, it's just be able to do that and uh, uh, to, to be able to to have pickup games within the neighborhood kids. Uh, at night, after you know, 
we lived right across the street from the courthouse and they had uh, a big lawn and, and they had these inset windows that you, it was just ideal for playing hide and seek. Typical night, we'd have 15 kids within a block and a half of where I lived playing together and we could all do that. And at the end of the evening, when it starts getting dark, the mothers would all holler, Johnny, come home, Johnny, come home. That's how we lived. <laughs> and it, it was it was just great growing up that way. And, and then to see how all the kids later on developed in life because they, they had a good background. Yeah, it's it, it, I feel like it really is a unique city. And you know, living right on the river um, is really something. I, I know my family and I always love boating and fishing. And uh, in addition to, to you know, biking and, and fishing as, as a kid, what, what favorite hobbies do you have now? Or what ways do you spend your free time now that you are you know, not in the CEO role of, of Fastenal or, or not on the, on the board? <clears throat> well, for exercise, I still jog. I, I started when I was about 45, uh, when my daughter wanted to go to two-mile road races when she was about 10. And I would take her, and then I decided, well, rather than sit here waiting 20 minutes for her to come back, why don't I go and start doing it myself. So that's when I started and I still do. I jog about 10 miles a, a week, uh, although it's more like a walk now at my age. Uh, and then other than that, uh, I still spend, I, I, I probably consider it a hobby. I still do a lot of things you know, related to uh, investing and, and projects that I have going here in Winona and construction and things of that nature. Uh, when I'm relaxing at home, what I'll do, I really enjoy doing uh, the Sudoku puzzles. Uh, and, and my daughter sent me a book of, uh, I don't know how many funny sayings that are all in cryptograms. So you get the pleasure of solving a cryptogram and having a good laugh at the end of it anyway. So it's that puzzle solving that I, I think I spend my evenings doing here. That's great. And, and you know, Ways to spend your free time, I feel like, is a is a big topic amongst you know people like myself. Right now, I'm I'm working full time and and have some things I'm trying to balance on the side that that I enjoy. Do you, do you have any advice for for people that are trying to to do what what I call a side hustle? You know, something outside of their nine to five. Uh, I, I think you could always look on it uh, as something that you're doing that's productive and with uh, some success you might find a career change. Yeah, that, that's great advice. That you, something that, that you enjoy, that you're passionate about. Um, so I, feel, I really feel if you're not passionate about it, you'll, you'll lose that, that motivation to, to devote your free time to it. You'd rather do something you actually like. You know, one of my <clears throat> daughters uh, went to film writing school and uh, she tried doing uh, some production of TV and then decided, no, it, it wasn't going to, that successful so she she's now a psychiatrist but she still is a great writer and, and still writes some wonderful stuff that i always enjoy reading you bring up reading so i, I that is something i growing up you know th going through school you, there's a lot of required reading um people might not feel like they have as much time to do recreational reading but is there a particular book or 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 series of books or, or author that that you found particularly helpful in your life and success development as well as business? Oh, if, if I had to pick one that I really appreciated reading, it was uh, Henry Adams, Mont Saint Michel and Sharp. What it was, what, what struck me is, is it was a good explanation of philosophical tech or theories, whether it was absolutism or nominalism, empiricism, but more importantly, what, what really struck home for me was this discussion in there of the building of the great cathedrals in the medieval years, Middle Ages, uh, and how these countries in Europe, in the, they may not have been countries, but uh, uh, provinces or whatever, built these cathedrals, and he calculated that it was the, the work that went into those cathedrals was 30% of their gross uh, national product. You know, that, that's what the people were doing with their efforts. And it, it gave me an appreciation of what 
gross national product is all about and, and how people produce goods and services and the flexibility you have, whether it's building cathedrals or in some cases building roads and bridges or sometimes improving agriculture, whatever. But it's, it's something that society, as long as you have creativity and people willing to take a risk and chance and do things like that that are new, uh, that's what our society improves. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, I I know that like you know when you when you find a good book that really resonates with you, it really I feel like kind of changes your perspective and and moving forward you have a different a different mindset about what what is important to to you to to achieve your common goal. You know, you touch on an organization is is groups of people working towards a common goal. Um, so I know that by by reading your book, my my perspective has you know has shifted to you know, a, a, diff, a higher level, I would say, a more refined level of what, what truly is important. You know, if I have aspirations to start a company, really, what do I need to focus on? So I really appreciate that, Bob. I'll tell you what, uh, when I talk to new managers at Fastenal, uh, at the end of my talk, I always say that I used to have 10 ideas that I'd leave them with. And then as I got older, I couldn't remember the 10, so I would do five. And now I'm down to just a couple. But the one that always stands out for me uh, is learn to challenge rather than to control. When you're in a leadership position, it's often easy to control people. And that's where you get what I call a fear of delegation, that uh, people that are leaders don't think people are going to do as well as they really are capable of doing. But when you learn to challenge rather than control, you challenge the people, you tell them what kind of outcomes you want and don't tell them exactly how to do it. You might tell them how you've been doing it, but let them find their own way to accomplish the same thing. And you'd be surprised how many times they're going to do better than what you thought they could do and better than what you were able to do. So challenge rather than control. Uh, that's probably the, the, the main thing that uh, I would like to leave people with that are going into business challenge rather than control. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, that, I mean, that really resonates with me as, as, you know, somebody who wants to be a good leader and, and wants to motivate others to be their best self. Um, Cause I, like you, I believe that that, that really is the way to, to achieve success as a group. Um, you have to be working towards that common goal, but person a might have a skill that they never really knew they had, but if you never challenge them to develop it, they, they, they won't. Well, perfect. Well, well, Bob, thank you so much for spending spending time with me to discuss business and life, um, to talk about leadership. I really, really appreciate having you on here as the first first interview guest of the Eric Mueller Show. Um, I know the audience really appreciated it. And it's an honor to be chosen. Thank, thank you for doing that, and uh, thank you for. As I see, you're wearing your fastenal jacket. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. That. Got to wrap the company for you. Well, Bob, thank you All so right. much. We'll we'll chat with you later on. I really appreciate you being on. And the best wishes to you. And hope you have a successful program. Yes, thank you, Bob. Well, there it is. The first interview of the Eric Mueller Show. I really had a great time chatting with Bob, and I hope you all learned a lot from him and his wisdom. Until next time, Mueller out. <laughs>